M S W Media. Thanks to Zbiotics for supporting the Daily Beans. Zbiotics engineered a pre-alcohol probiotic. Go to zbiotics.com slash daily beans to get 15% off your first order when you use Daily Beans at checkout. So you want to marry my daughter? Yes, I do. So do you hang out in the hood all the time or do you just come up here for our food and women? This January. Your family, my family. I don't know how this is going to work. I like your braids. Thank you. Exhibit had braids. Jonah Hill, Lauren London, David Duchovny, Nia Long, with Julia Louis-Dreyfus and Eddie Murphy. What's up with white cuz? Am I white cuz? Well, I'm not. You People, directed by Kenya Barris. Rated R, streaming January 27th only on Netflix. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Monday, January 23rd, 2023. Today, Judge Middlebrooks awards Hillary et al. nearly $1 million in sanctions for Trump and Haba's vexatious lawsuit. A January 6th defendant pleads guilty to death threats against AOC. Former White House aide and current douchebag Johnny McEntee has testified before Jack Smith's grand jury. The Department of Justice shuts down Jim Jordan's dumb subcommittee investigating the investigation. Three active duty Marines have been charged for their participation in the insurrection. Abbott Laboratories is now under federal criminal investigation for the baby formula crisis. A new film about Justice Kavanaugh premieres at Sundance. Ten are dead in a mass shooting in Monterey amid New Year's celebrations. And Jeff Zients is set to replace Ron Klain as the White House chief of staff. I'm your host, Allison Gill. My goodness, that could have almost been close. We were like 10 seconds away from a record for most headlines for the weekend. Uh, Dana's out today. She will be back on Wednesday. Also out right now is a new episode of Jack, the podcast with me and Andrew McCabe about the special counsel and my good pal Johnny McEntee of the Presidential Personnel Office is now a member of the very exclusive club of people subpoenaed by special counsel Jack Smith. We talk all about that in the episode of Jack, plus a lot of other stuff. That episode is out now. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And some quick news hits here before we get to the hot notes. Ron Klain is stepping down as White House Chief of Staff. It's probably one of the best, if not the best, Chiefs of Staff in White House history. This move was expected. It's not weird. It's not unheard of. That is a very grueling job to be the Chief of Staff. We knew from the jump, Ron Klain said that he wasn't going to be there the entire term. I will miss him, but it is said he will be replaced by the very capable Jeff Zients, who ran Biden's COVID-19 response early in his administration. So best of luck in that very difficult job to Jeff Sines. Also, police have located a white van they believe is connected to the gunman who opened fire at a ballroom dance studio in Monterey Park on Saturday night, killing 10 people and injuring 10 others. Multiple police cars surrounded the vehicle in Torrance on Sunday morning. Shots were fired. Law enforcement sources told the Times. It was not known who was in the vehicle, but the body was slumped over. We do not know if they're deceased or whether that was the gunman But we will keep you posted as the story unfolds. Absolutely tragic. Another mass shooting in America. All right. We have a lot of news to get to, uh, as you could hear from the introduction and the headlines. So let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right. So for a while now, Jim Jordan has been sending letters to the Department of Justice demanding documents and information about the investigations into Donald Trump and likely investigations into Jim Jordan. Recently, he formed a judiciary subcommittee in the House of Representatives that will be tasked with investigating the investigations. We all know how investigating the investigators goes, just to ask John Durham. So allow me to read to you from this letter that the Department of Justice sent to Jim in response on January 20th. Here we go. We are in receipt of your January 17th letters to the Department of Justice as well as three of our law enforcement components, the FBI, the DEA, and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives, regarding information requests that you sent during the 117th Congress. In light of your appointment as the chair of the House Committee on the Judiciary, the department would like to take this opportunity to review our practices with respect to congressional engagement for the benefit of both new and returning members of the committee. 
We look forward to a productive relationship with the 118th Congress. We welcome your interest in the department's work. (laughs) The department stands ready to provide expertise as the committee considers potential legislation. We often provide technical assistance on draft or introduce legislation to ensure the drafters are aware of how it may impact civil litigation, criminal investigations and prosecutions, grant making, and other matters within the department's purview, and to ensure its constitutionality. We encourage you to share legislative drafts as early as possible because our review can be time-consuming. We anticipate your committee will invite department representatives to appear at hearings, which serve as important tools for information to the public about the department's work. Preparation for hearings often takes significant time. So the department has long insisted that Congressional Committee send a written invitation for public testimony at least two weeks in advance of the hearing date. The department also will be better able to meet your needs at hearings if your request is specific concerning the information the committee seeks. While we work diligently to accommodate requests for public testimony, it may not always be possible to participate or to address all the topics the committee wishes to raise. Consistent with longstanding policy and practice, any oversight request must be weighed against the department's interest in protecting the integrity of its work. Longstanding department policy prevents us from confirming or denying the existence of pending investigations in response to congressional requests or providing non-public information about our investigations. The department's obligation to protect the government's ability to prosecute fully and fairly is vital to the executive branch's core constitutional function to investigate and prosecute criminal matters. Finally, the department is committed to protecting the rights of whistleblowers, for example, employees or applicants for employment who have made a protected disclosure, and we're committed to complying with both the letter and the spirit of the Whistleblower Protection Act, Title V, U.S. Code, Section 2302B8. Nothing in the foregoing is intended to impact requirements, obligations, rights, sanctions, and liabilities created by controlling executive orders and statutory provisions. We hope this information is helpful. We look forward to a productive relationship. Please do not hesitate to contact this office if we may provide additional assistance regarding this or any other matter. Interesting and fun. All of your requests will take significant time. Please submit them early. And we're not going to tell you anything about ongoing investigations because it's our constitutional right and duty under the separations of powers clause not to you big piece of shit. Uh, Anyway, that was a great letter. I loved it. I'm glad they sent it. Also in the news, former President Trump on Friday withdrew his lawsuit seeking to block New York Attorney General Tish James from accessing materials from his private trust. In a one-page notice filed with Judge Middlebrooks, Trump's attorney, Timothy Weber, said he was voluntarily dismissing the lawsuit without prejudice. No further reason was given, but I bet I know why. Last month, Middlebrooks rejected Trump's efforts to obtain a temporary injunction to block Tish James from obtaining documents from the trust, saying Trump had no substantial likelihood of success on the merits. (laughs) A motion to dismiss the lawsuit is still pending, or it was at the time. The move comes one day after Middlebrooks sanctioned Trump and another one of his attorneys, Alina Haba, for $937,000 and change. That was a lawsuit that Trump brought against Hillary Clinton and 30 other defendants saying that that they conspired against him in 2016. Middlebrooks wrote, this case should never have been brought. Its inadequacy as a legal claim was evident from the start. No reasonable lawyer would have filed it. Intended for a political purpose, none of the counts of the amended complaint state a cognizable legal claim, unquote. So that is hilarious. He sued Hillary and 30 other people. And we talk about this, Andrew McCabe and I, because he's one of the defendants in that lawsuit. He was. I mean, the, the, the lawsuit's been dismissed. We talk about that on the, on the most recent episode of, of Jack, because it does actually tie in with the special counsel investigation. It's very interesting how you want to listen to that episode. But he sued them all, everybody who had anything to do with the 2016 investigation into Trump Russia. And Judge Middlebrooks dismissed it and then invited Hillary at all to file sanctions. And then a couple, maybe like a month and a half ago, one of the guys was awarded sanctions, a $50,000 a fine that payable to the court, plus his attorney's fees, which were about, I think, like $22,000 or something like that. And the judge awarded those sanctions. And then that same day that the judge awarded the sanctions to that one guy, Trump filed his lawsuit, a new lawsuit against Tish James. 
which is with same kind of bullshit, no cognizable legal anything in that entire lawsuit. It was vexatious. It was frivolous. He actually cited the Tis James lawsuit while awarding sanctions, a second round of sanctions in the Hillary lawsuit. So that was what happened on Friday on my birthday. Happy birthday to me. Almost a million dollars in sanctions for Alina Haba and Trump, severally and jointly liable for that money. That means you guys get to figure out who gets to pay what. I advised Alina Haba to hurry up and sue Donald for, for at least half of those fees. Otherwise, I think her firm will be holding the bag on that because I think Trump will be like, no, you told me to do it. I'm not paying a dime. Uh, so we'll see how that turns out. But it's going to cause some infighting between Alina Haba and Donald Trump, which just brings me joy. But uh, within 12 hours of that million dollar sanctions, fine. They dismissed their suit, the similar suit against Tish James which I advised them to do, not 15 hours before. All right, next up, three active duty members of the Marine Corps assigned to intelligence-related jobs, including one at the National Security Agency in Maryland, have been charged with participating in January 6th. Uh, Corporal Micah Coomer, Sergeant Joshua Abbott, and Sergeant Dodge Dale Hellinen were arrested Tuesday and Wednesday near Camp Pendleton, California, right up the road from me and Fort Meade and in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, respectively, and appeared in local federal courts. The FBI said a bot admitted to entering the Capitol with two buddies during a June 2022 interview that was part of his security clearance process while assigned to the Marine Corps Cryptologic Support Battalion, which is partnered and headquartered with the NSA at Fort Meade. According to the charging papers, a bot said they walked around and tried not to get hit with tear gas and admitted he heard how the event was being portrayed negatively and decided that he should not tell anybody about going into the Capitol. Fantastic. Uh, I hope they lose all of their benefits. I hope that they aren't administratively discharged. I hope they get what's called a big chicken dinner, which is a bad conduct discharge or dishonorable discharge. They should not have access to taxpayer-funded benefits or pensions. That's just my two cents. And a Texas man charged for attacking the Capitol pled guilty Monday to threatening AOC on Twitter shortly after the riot. On January 6th, in the hours after the attack of the Capitol, after the Capitol had been cleared, Ocasio-Cortez posted a tweet saying, impeach. Garrett Miller replied, assassinate AOC. Miller also pled guilty to assaulting, resisting, or impeding officers and admitted to intentionally forcing his hands on an officer while they tried to remove him from the Capitol that day. During the hearing, Judge Carl Nichols, a Trump appointee, read a statement of factual evidence to which Miller agreed That stated Miller acted with serious intent at the time he posted that tweet, assassinate AOC, and meant for it to be a threat. In other Department of Justice news, Abbott Laboratories is under investigation by the Department of Justice. The company confirmed that on Friday, almost a year after it shut down a Michigan baby formula plant after illnesses were reported. Abbott did not specify what aspect of the company is under Justice Department scrutiny, but last June I tweeted, Sometimes I wonder if corporations cause inflation or shut down formula production or fix gas prices so that Republicans will win elections so that their CEOs can get more tax breaks and less regulation. Corporations wouldn't do that, would they? Well, I guess we'll find out. And finally, from Jada Yuan at The Washington Post, in a content warning here for sexual assault, quote, we're getting more tips, unquote. That's Amy Hurdy. She announced that Friday night after the Sundance Film Festival premiere of Justice, a documentary she produced about the sexual assault allegations against Kavanaugh. The film's existence was a surprise, with the festival only revealing on Thursday its opening night that it was making a very last minute addition to the lineup. The first documentary from Swingers and the Born Identity director, Doug Lyman. Within a half hour of the news getting out, Lyman said in the post-screening Q&A, The film team started hearing from people who had sent the FBI tips before Kavanaugh's confirmation, which the agency did not further investigate. And I should say here, yes, they set up a tip line, the FBI, 4,500 tips came in to that tip line. Now, the the thing is, is that, and this is just government insider shit that I happen to know because I worked at the government. When the FBI does, this, this wasn't a criminal investigation into Kavanaugh. This was a background check. They, they wanted a, additional background check into Kavanaugh. And when you task the FBI with a background check, because the FBI does all the background checks for all of the agencies. When I got my job at the VA, the FBI did my background check. The client 
is the person who's requesting the background check. Okay. And the FBI is under policy, under either by per their policy, they give all of the information they gather to the client, to whom whomever requested the background information. So for example, when I applied to the VA, FBI did my background check, FBI finds anything at all, they give everything over to the Department of Veterans Affairs so that the Department of Veterans Affairs can make the decision. The FBI is not supposed to go on and continue investigating all these tips and following leads and opening investigations. They do the work and they hand it over and that's it. In the Kavanaugh case, the White House, the Trump White House, ordered the additional background check. Therefore, all the 4,500 tips that came in had to be handed over to the White House, to Trump, and up to, up to the White House what to do with it. So, of course, they're not going to do shit with it. What my, where my understanding gets weird is if they find like he murdered somebody that went on, you know, unpunished or sexually assaulted somebody that went unpunished. Do are can they or do they are they able to continue that investigation that I don't know. But they didn't follow up on any of these forty five hundred tips that that we know for sure. Now, Lyman, the filmmaker, gives Ramirez the platform that she never got in front of the Senate. This isn't really about Blase Ford. This is about Ramirez. A long emotional interview with the Boulder-based former Yale classmate of Kavanaugh forms the movie's spine. Uh, Though the interview doesn't contain much that hasn't already been reported, it's powerful to hear someone who doesn't enjoy being in the spotlight tell her own story with all the anguished starts and stops that come with trying to recall a nearly 40-year-old traumatic event. If there's a smoking gun in Lyman's film, the post continues, It's a voice message left on the FBI tip line from Max Steyer, the president and CEO of the Partnership for Public Service who attended Yale with Kavanaugh and Ramirez. In the previously unheard recording, Steyer says classmates told him not just that Kavanaugh stuck his penis in Ramirez's face, but that afterward, then this is where the content warning really comes in, Kavanaugh went to the bathroom to make himself erect before allegedly returning to assault her again, hoping to amuse an audience of mutual friends. In the film, Ramirez says she'd suppressed that memory so deeply she couldn't recall that second incident, even when Ronan Farrow explicitly asked her about it. Steyer's message to the FBI also cites another incident involving a different woman, which he says he witnessed firsthand. A severely inebriated Kavanaugh, his dorm mate, pulling his pants down at a different party while a group of soccer players forced a drunk female freshman to hold his penis. The woman's friends told the New York Times in 2019 she did not remember the incident and did not want to come forward after seeing the treatment of Blase Ford. Steyer does not appear in the film to elaborate, nor did he give further interviews when his tip first surfaced in 2019. The filmmakers told the audience Friday they have a website, justicefilm.com, where people can send additional tips. That's justicefilm.com. All right, everybody, that is the hot notes. Stick around. We will be right back with the listener submitted good news. If you have any good news you want to send in, do so at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. Stay with us. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody, it's AG. It is easy to skip a morning workout if you had a few cocktails the night before. Yeah, I know I have. Uh, if you're committed to your healthy routine this year, you need to try Zbiotics. Zbiotics Pre Alcohol Probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking, and here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in your gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your next rough day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut, where you need it the most. Just remember to drink Zbiotics before drinking alcohol, drink responsibly, and get a good night's sleep to feel your best tomorrow. I tried Zbiotics for the first time last weekend before I went out with some friends for my birthday. As instructed, I drank the bottle of Zbiotics before I had any alcohol, and it was amazing how good I felt the next day. It made such a big difference. And now the first drink I have every time I go out on the town will be a bottle of Zbiotics. Give Zbiotics a try for yourself. Go to zbiotics.com slash dailybeans to get 15% off your first order when you use code dailybeans, all one word, at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money-back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they will refund your money, no questions asked. That's Zbiotics, Z-B-I-O-T-I-C-S dot com slash Daily Beans and use code Daily Beans. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Who likes good news, everyone? Then good news, everyone. Near. 
Good news, good news. And if you have any good news, confessions, corrections, you want to play What the Mutt with us and listen to me stumble through trying to guess what your rescue pup is made of. Or if you want to send a shout out to somebody you love or a small business in your area that needs some support. Or if you want to put up an adoptable pet in your area that needs a forever home. Anything you want to send to us at all, Whoopi stories, shit kids say, send to us at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. First up from Diane. Hello, ladies. I saw the news about Toadzilla, a six pound toad in Australia, and I immediately thought of AG. Here's an NPR story that's definitely worth checking out as a belated birthday gift. She's quite a sight to behold. It's not a frog orgy, but I think she might intimidate the other frogs. She appears to be about a banana and a half from head to rump. Also, here's a picture of my Chihuahua mix. Feel free to play what the mutt, but I have no answers for you. Here's my thoughts about the mix. He's definitely part Chihuahua as he's high strung as fuck and he has that anxious shake I associate with the breed. He's also this growly attempted purr he's got suggests a smidge of feline in the mix and a snort that I swear is 110% pig. Whatever the mix, he's pretty loyal. Uh, He makes a point to spend a little time in everyone's bed every night. Oh, how sweet. Okay, here's the six pound toad. Oh my God, it's huge. Breaks the record. On my birthday. Thank you for that. And your little chihuahua is so adorable. Looks like part Basenji. A little bit. Absolutely beautiful. How cute. I love that he goes. He's got equal opportunity cuddles and goes into everybody's bed for snuggles. That's amazing. Next up from Maria de la Flamingo. I am from the Cleveland area. Me too. Where my Cleveland area family were butter and cabbage rolls were alternate blocks on the nutrition pyramid. (laughs) So I'm happy to say I have lost the weight equivalent of my golden doodle, 55 pounds. It's nice to shop in my own closet and wear the jeans I stashed away for someday dreams. For pet tax, I'm including some real cuteness from our sweet rescue doodle Farley, named after the comedian since he's goofy and he's been identified as the rare breed North American snack hound. And our other furry son, Freddie Meow Curie. <laughs> I appreciate all the hard work that you've put into being a reliable source for news for several years. And I did wonder if your erstwhile founder, Liz Waring, was pictured on the caricature of a female sleuth. <laughs> news, Liz Waring. Okay, adorable doggo and adorable cat Oh, Aw, looks like my kitty Ned I had a long time ago. By the way, that embroidered pillow is beautiful with the St. Nick with the Kris Kringle on it. That's gorgeous. If you made that, if not, still beautiful. Love it. Next up from Jana, pronouns she and her. Some days the beans makes me tear up feeling like I am being wrapped in a large hug. Oh, I'm a massage therapist. I've had my business 21 years now. I also run a feral cat rescue in my city. I named our little group the Cat Herders for obvious reasons. It's just the three of us, but we work hard trapping, fixing, and feeding all the ferals. We do home some of them, just depends on their personality and desire to own a human or not. In all, we've saved 47 ferals and we're still going strong. I wish I could name them all here, but y'all would be here all day listing them. They all get names. I feed several colonies every day. 2022 was the worst year of my life. I lost my sweet boy, Thor, an English cream golden retriever. He was diagnosed with bone cancer in his back leg. I called a specialty vet out on 92222. And she helped him cross the bridge. I held his sweet face until he left me. I realize he's also part of my identity, so I'm trying to rediscover who I am without him. Some people don't seem to take the death of a pet as seriously as we should. I've added some pics of Thor and some of my ferals. Thank you for coming to my ears each day. You can't imagine how much it helps keeping up with what's going on in the world. P.S. I drive my kids to the brink singing the Daily Beans theme song all the time. Legit, they even sing it. (laughs) It's so catchy, it gets stuck in my head. A lot. Yeah, Jana, we can blame They Might Be Giants for that. They always put out a catchy tune. Oh, what a beautiful baby. The patriotic bear. What a sweetheart. Oh, and look at the smoky boy cat. Hello. Blessed are the feral cats, caretakers, for they have fallen in love a thousand times while their wallets are empty, their hearts are full. Thank you so much for that work. I'm busy rescuing one feral cat, Jana. I can't imagine 47. So thank you for your work. Really appreciate that. Next up from Pasha, she, her, sounds like Natasha. Is it just me or the last three months felt like the best birthday ever every day? Thank you for the wit, humor, and no bullshit approach to the news. My thoughts are with you for your missing cat. I hope you find him and you're able to donate the reward money to your local shelter. For my good news, I have an update on chicken. He turned into quite the sophisticated troublemaker. 
His new favorite activity is quote unquote, helping me do the dishes. This entails him standing in the middle of the sink while I try to wash and rinse. His exciting news is that he's in a cutest cat contest. He's standing strong at second, but I think he's going to lock it down. The grand prize would go directly to my nonprofit to help cats and kittens get spayed and neutered and vaccinated. Three more days of voting. We'll put the link in the show notes. Definitely vote for chicken. Currently number two. Let's get him to number one. And that's America's Fave, F-A-V, pet dot com slash 2023 slash chicken hyphen six five D-F. D as in dog, F as in Frank. That's America's F-A-V-P-E-T, Fave Pet, America's Fave Pet dot com slash 2023 slash chicken hyphen six five D-F. There's chicken. Everybody vote. He is really, really cute. He's got such a little skinny head and big peats. Oh, oh, nice lewd photo there at the end. Thank you for that. Sharing the belly. Giving a lewd. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for your submissions. I really appreciate it. I'll be back in your ears tomorrow. Please give a listen to Jack. It's a really good episode. Made some really critical connections between these Middlebrooks Trump sanctions and what's going on with Jack Smith. You don't want to miss it. Everybody, I'll be back, like I said, um, tomorrow. I think Dana's still out tomorrow. So thanks for sticking with me, Solo. I really appreciate it. Until then, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Boat blue over Q and bring someone with you. I've been AG and them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg and Amy Carrero. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants, and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. They Might Be Giants have been on the road for too long. Too long. And They Might Be Giants aren't even sorry. Not even sorry. And audiences like the shows too much. Too much. And now They Might Be Giants are playing their breakthrough album, Flood. All of it. And they still have time for other songs. They're fooling around. Who can stop They Might Be Giants and their liberal rock agenda? Who? No one. This ad was paid for with somebody else's money.